Good morning. Welcome to Worship at the First Congregational Church of Clarendon. Today is Sunday, March 14th. Today is the fourth Sunday in Lent, and we are continuing to read through Matthew's Gospel. Today we're reading from Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. Now Jesus has some strong words today about something we all deal with in life, anger. Now the dictionary defines anger as a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, even hostility, feeling threatened or under attack. Jesus himself experienced these feelings. He knew the danger of anger. And God's word for us today is to seek to find ways not for anger to control us and how to address conflicts with others in love. Let's worship God.
Good morning, kids. Today we're going to be talking about anger. Now, the Bible says that, you know, we're all born with lots of emotions within us. Emotions that are happy or sad or angry or afraid, things like that. But anger, you know how kids sometimes throw temper tantrums when they don't get their own way. And it's pretty a normal thing. Hopefully we grow out of some of those temper tantrums. But, you know, even adults get good and mad sometimes. And it's not a pretty sight. And, you know, though feelings are normal and anger is but a feeling, still, God wants us to learn to control those feelings. Well, I have a little demonstration that I'm going to be showing you in just a few moments about how sometimes it's easier said than done to keep from being angry. So I will be showing you two bottles of Diet Coke and some Mentos. Now, if you've ever done this little experiment, you've, you know. The first bottle, uh, it's been sitting around a little while, has a lid off, the carbonation's all gone. And that may be someone who tries to follow God's will, store up good things in one's heart. Second bottle, well, that one has lots of carbonation, and you're going to see what happens when we stick a mento down in that bottle. So here we are at the Taylor Farm, and we have before us Diet Coke. Now this Diet Coke has been stirred a little bit, doesn't have a whole lot of carbonation left in it, and this is going to represent someone who tries to give their concerns and their angers and their irritations to the Lord. And this would be somebody gets you really mad, but you've really tried to not get mad at things that you shouldn't. So I'm going to drop this Mentos in and just see what it does. Ha! Huh. Didn't do anything at all because I'm trying to be a person who relies on the Lord, trying to trust in the Lord. And therefore, I think I can try to keep from getting angry at lots of different things. Hi, I'm here in my backyard to demonstrate with a simple science experiment what can happen when someone who is an angry person gets a little angrier. Something happens. Maybe, I don't know, my brother just switched channels on me. Maybe he kicked me for no reason. Or she took away my favorite toy, whatever it was. And I was already pretty irritated. And then when that one thing happened, well, I got so angry. And it was just like dropping this little Mentos into a can of Coke. Let's see what happens. Oh yeah. Are we overflowing with anger? Are we getting really, really mad so that nobody can even be around us? We're so mad at everything. And it just spills and spills until it just overflows. But that's not how God wants us to be. That every little thing that irritates us makes us just blow up, just like this Diet Coke. I think there is another way. May God bless us as we try our best to show love to our friends, to our family, to our neighbors. Let's have a prayer about that. Let's pray. Dear God, you know times where we get mad at somebody and it is really hard at times to keep from saying bad words or saying things we really regret later on. So we ask you to be strong within us that we may be strong in our faith, that we may look to you to store up good when we're having some issues with somebody in our family or a friend. Guide us that in all ways we may give the glory to you 
For this we ask in Jesus Christ. Amen. May you be blessed this week as God is working good things within you to the glory of his name. Amen. Let us now, as God's people, come before him in our time of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we praise you and exalt you. Just to say those words lifts us out of the ordinary and opens us to expand our horizons for you to enter in. You are the reality beyond what we can see or hear or experience through our usual human senses. To know you is like to feel that fresh breeze blowing through us. And all that is uncertain drifts away, like overcast clouds that give way to a radiant sunshine. We praise you and exalt you, Lord, for without you, life is transitory. It soon passes away. Dear God, you know what this week has been like, both the highs and the lows. You know our frustrations and inner conflict. The times when we have struggled to maintain our equilibrium. Forgive us when we have gotten angry, when we failed to trust you to help us resolve our conflicts. You remind us that our relationship with you is strained when we allow arguments and problems with others to fester. And as we confess and seek to be reconciled in our relationships, so we praise you for your forgiving grace in Jesus Christ. For it is you that makes us fresh and new. So send your spirit upon us to restore our vision, to renew us in faith, to re-energize us for service in your name. Father, may we long for you with every breath we take as if we could not take a deep enough breath that will satisfy our longing. And the more we reach for you, the more you give. And what joy we know. And so, Lord, we pray for those who have not found you, who are lost, who have stumbled, who feel distant from your love. We pray for those in harm's way, for those who need your saving grace. We pray for those who are physically weakened or emotionally fragile, as well as financially strapped. We praise you for your love in Jesus Christ. For he took our sins upon the cross and he gave himself for us. So hear all our prayers in Christ's name. For we pray as Jesus taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
アメン Our scripture for this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel. We are reading from the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 26. And Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, That anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you. May be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. May God bless a reading and understanding of His holy word. Amen. This week I was reading a book about an older man. Now, he was a curmudgeon in every sense of the word. He got angry a lot, he used swear words, and on the surface, he really didn't care much for other people. He sounded like the kind of person that Jesus was saying was subject to judgment. Maybe you know someone like him that has some rough edges, but As I continue to read this book, the man's character emerged as one who actually did care a lot for people. He desperately loved and missed his wife, who had recently died. He had long term relationships with his neighbors, even if some of those relationships had become strained. He came to care about new neighbors and people he met. And you may know someone like the character in this book, whose gruff exterior cannot hide the tenderness of his heart. 
But what Jesus is saying today in our scripture is that relationships matter a lot. We get it that murder is a definite wrong, it's a punishable offense, but anger? Jesus says that calling someone a bad name, even saying, you fool, is a sin putting one in danger of hell. Wow, are we in trouble or what? You know, imagine the scenario. A driver pulls out in front of you, causing you to have to slam on your brakes to avoid hitting him. Do you have a few choice words for that action? Yep, you probably do. And, and you know, it's not difficult naming a situation where you encounter people who are doing inane or irritating things. And our response fits right in with what Jesus says will land us in trouble. Now we know there are certain people who by their very nature are less likely to express their anger or put any insults in front of someone. Maybe they hold it inside. Maybe they're able to just slough it off and forget it. But Jesus is saying here that it is the absence of love that God judges. Not whether you express or refrain from expressing your anger. So if you're squirming in your seat a little bit right now, I think you're in good company with the rest of us. Because we do, we let the minor irritations of life get to us. We lose sight of the God we serve and we get ourselves into trouble. But I want you to stop and think for a moment to try to take your thoughts in a different direction. And first I want to go back a few chapters in Matthew where Matthew writes about some of the temptations of Jesus. Now we are told that Jesus had three distinct times of temptation. And Ray Stedman explains these as a temptation first that's confronting one's, I say, physical nature. Uh, secondly, it's a temptation striking the human soul. And third, of one's spirit. Physical. Okay, so Jesus was hungry. He had been fasting in the wilderness for 40 days and nights. And, and you know as well as me, when we're hungry, we can get crabby. It's a lot harder to be nice. Then the second temptation was when Satan asked Jesus to throw himself off from the very uppermost pinnacle of the temple so that God would rescue him. And as Ray Stedman explains it, that is one that we can really see as that desire within us to want to have a claim to be on the pinnacle, to be admired, to be honored by other people. And this, then, is the temptation of pride seeking status. The third, well, that's of our spirit. Whom do we worship? Do we worship God or another idol? So these temptations, we may say, are representative of the kinds of temptations we face throughout our lives. So body, soul, spirit. I think these also factor in on how we come to faith. Certainly it's been rough this past year because physically we haven't been able to be together too much. We haven't had coffee hour in who knows how long, almost a year now. And, and that physical sharing of coffee and a little snack and conversation, we've missed that after church. And we grow closer through these friendships that we cultivate. And that, in turn, strengthens us as persons that belong to this body of Christ. Well, faith impacts 
our souls in the sense of our need for self-expression. You may give yourself through art. Someone may else may give themselves through organization or leadership or finances, all those things. So self-expression is also an, a part of our faith of who we are. And then there is our spirit. Our spirits that longs to be deeply connected with God, that we may increasingly turn our hearts over to the Lord, commit to worshiping Him alone. Well, as our scripture for today continues through Jesus' teachings from the Sermon on the Mount, um, certainly he's teaching them from some of the temptations that he knows are so common to humanity. Those that are physical, those that are of the soul, and those that are of the spirit. Well, many of our temptations do come from our, I say, physical life, as we may see in our scripture, especially today. Um, from our physical life comes murder, the most extreme, to anger, to swearing, to holding on to a grudge, having lawsuits with an adversary. Paul in Galatians 5 taught about things that undermine our relationships. Things like hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. And these are all temptations that humanity faces from one time or another. Now Jesus began the sermon as he says, you have heard it said. Who said? Certainly God said murder is wrong. Um, it is the sixth of the Ten Commandments and the first commandment that speaks to our relationships with others. Because God is in charge of creation. It's not for us to determine the end of another person's life. Only God. Well, murder is the most extreme action one person may take to destroy a relationship. But Jesus is also saying that one's righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. Now, maybe back in the day, people would feel, oh, well, I follow the law. I haven't murdered anybody. But here Jesus is raising the bar. He says it's the absence of love that is going against God's law. And that's where anger or swearing at someone, even calling somebody an idiot, violates God's law requiring us to love one another. And what Jesus points out, it's more than our outward actions that count. Because we need to also examine our inward motivations. Now, there was a time when Jesus was accused of eating with, you know, so-called called unclean hands. Meaning they were not ceremonially clean as with the Pharisees before they ate. Now, Jesus replied, it's not about either the foods we eat or how we wash our hands. It counts before God because these are but our human traditions, the kinds of foods we eat, the way we cleansing, those sorts of things. He says eating unclean food, that does not defile a person. No, it's what comes out of a person. Evil thoughts greed, deceit, envy, slander, arrogance. Now a human court will try a person for a wrong action like murder. And God, well God sees within our hearts and will judge us according to what's going on inside. So can you turn over to God your feelings of anger towards another person who has wronged you? Can you let God be the judge of that person rather than presuming you have the right to judge another's actions? 
can you allow God to take charge of not only your life, but how you respond even in difficult situations? I think of Joseph in the Old Testament. Um, he was one who told his brothers about some of the dreams God had given him about Joseph reigning over uh, his brothers. Well, naturally, his brothers were not real happy about hearing that. And they became angry at Joseph, angry enough to throw Joseph into a cistern, and then sell him off to the nearest caravan trader that was heading on its way off to Egypt. And they thought, ah, they're well rid of him. Well, then years passed. Um, Joseph became second in command within Egypt, second only to Pharaoh in the land. There was a famine. Joseph's brothers traveled to Egypt in order to find food. And after a series of circumstances, Joseph and his brothers were reunited. Now, Joseph could have easily found ways to retaliate for the wrong they had done to Joseph so long ago. And yes, Joseph tested them to see the sincerity of their hearts. But what did he tell them? You, you intended harm for me, but God, God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So can we give God the reins to our emotions? Can we put God in charge of how we respond when someone is in opposition to us? And I don't mean just to deny our anger, but to actually step back and give it to God. And yes, it's really hard when we're angry, when we're tired, when we're hungry, when we're just emotionally spent. No wonder that first temptation came to Jesus when he was so very physically vulnerable. Self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians chapter 5. And, and there's a lot of reasons why a person gets angry, flies off the handle, lashes out at someone. You know, you're at the end of your patience. It's been a hard day. You're stressed. You're tired. And you are at that same place of physical weakness like Jesus. And yes, one's physical condition can and does often impact one's emotional response. Now, Jesus, at times, did get angry. But his anger was one that was a, I say, righteous anger. Because maybe people were being disregarded in their suffering. Maybe God was being dishonored. And that's completely different from an anger that stems simply from just wanting to get somebody off your back. So we are soon going to be turning to the last days of Jesus' life, to his arrest and crucifixion. And there we were reminded that Jesus did not answer his accusers despite their very fractured charges against him. It is written in 1 Peter chapter 2, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges rightly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. Now Jesus goes on also to say that Having a divided heart interferes with worship 
Because you see, our God is a God of love. And yet, how can we say we love God if we perpetuate a conflict with a family member, with a church member, with a neighbor? And these are some strong words that come from 1 John chapter 4. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And God has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love his brother and sister. So worship is more than just this vertical line between you and God alone. Because your relationships with others, that's that horizontal line, they matter greatly to God. Think about the Lord's Prayer, where we pray to forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. God is ready to forgive our wrongdoing as we forgive those who have wronged us. And as you worship, God's going to ask, why are you continuing this conflict with someone? And what is a godly way to resolve these feelings? How to deal with this problem of a split in love? As Jesus is saying that resolving these conflicts, it's so important And it's important enough that you should even interrupt worship in order to go do it. So how do we not give in to anger? And we're still, how not to perpetuate a conflict so it becomes harder and harder to resolve? I appreciate the words of Jesus to not let the sun go down on your anger but to seek as much as you are able to be reconciled with one another before that argument has hardened into an even bigger problem. So in this time we have left for worship today, I pray that you will give over to God anything that has been tough for you this week. Put your problems your strong emotions, your fears into God's hands. Ask God to help you deal with times when you have gotten angry and ask for ways that you may resolve these arguments peacefully. Pray above all for a heart of love, a faith that allows God to be in charge of all things and the means that we may be undivided in our worship of God, in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
now as we conclude this our online worship for this morning go out into the world in peace trusting not in your own goodness but in the grace of god in every situation give thanks to him and now may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you and remain with you always God's peace be with you until we meet again. Amen.